Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Professor Chris Alden. I'm uh, director of LSE Ideas, and I'm here today uh, to uh, discuss with you or to chair a session about what makes police reform and police reform movement successful. So it's couldn't be more topical, and one uh, I'm sure you're, you're uh, eager to hear uh, uh, the inputs of our colleagues and our panel on. Um, this is an event, as I said, hosted by LSE Ideas, but also hosted by the Institute for Global City Policing at UCL, the Urban Violence Research Network, and is being convened with my colleague, Dr. Liam O'Shea and Dr. Z uh, Zoa Wasim, also at UCL. Um, this is, in fact, this is the third of four sessions examining how to reform the police. The first of these was held at King's College and looked at police reform in the global south more broadly, um, examining how it, how it works to reduce police mal malpractice and the importance of the local context. The second session was hosted by today's partners and looks at what contributes to successful organizational level change. And our final session, which will be on 4th of June, will explore how donors can best support police reform in non-Western contexts. So again, today's event, we're, we're hoping to look at the impact of socio-political dynamics and social movements around reform. And our distinguished panel brings together experts from uh, with an extensive practitioner and academic experience, people who've done work on police, policing and police and politics in the former Soviet Union in South Asia, the US, Africa, and Latin America. So let me introduce our colleagues um, and our panelists and colleagues. First, the first person to speak is, is um, Matthew Light. Uh, he's an associate professor of criminology and sociolegal studies at the University of Toronto. And his research focuses on issues of migration policy, criminal justice and policing in the post-Soviet countries. His book, Fragile Migration Rights, Freedom of Movement in Post-Soviet Russia, was published in 2016 by Routledge and examines the evolution of rights of freedom of movement in, in contemporary Russia based on case studies of four regions. Our next speaker, Jyoti uh, Belur, um, is an associate professor at the University College London's Department of Security and Crime Science. She's lectured at the University of Mumbai before joining the Indian Police Service and serving as a senior police officer in the north of India. Um, she's undertaken research for the, the UK's Home Office, College of Policing, ESRC, and the Metropolitan Police Service. Uh, as, aside from uh, teaching, she has numerous published works, over, uh, including 45 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and reports. Following, following uh, uh, her will be uh, Kathy Lisa Schneider. Um, who is a professor at the School of International Service at the American University in, in uh, Washington, DC. She teaches and writes on democracy, dictatorship and resistance, comparative social movements, collective violence, racial profiling, police violence, racial and ethnic discrimination in Europe, the United States and Latin America. Her publications include Police Power and Ra Race Riots, Urban Unrest in Paris and New York, 2014, Shantytown protest in Pinochet's Italy and uh, Italy, sorry, Pinochet's uh, Chile, um, and then uh, collective violence, contentious politics, and social change. A Charles Tilly reader. Um, finally, our last uh, participant and speaker uh, on the panel will be um, Zianda uh, Sturman. Um, who's a project leader for the Institute for Justice and, and Reconciliation, a think tank, an NGO based in Cape Town, and a former and she's a former Fulbright and Chevening scholar. She's the author of Can We Be Safe? The Future of Policing in South Africa, and her interests include public policy, security, human rights, labor rights, immigration issues, and gender studies on the African continent and in South Africa in particular. And her latest paper will be coming out on it in the South African Journal on International Affairs. Once they've all spoken, we're, we're very pleased to have uh, Andrea uh, Varsori, who will um, act as a discussant. Um, he's an assistant professor of criminology at the University of Huddersfield and co-coordinator co for the Urban Violence Research Network. He'd finished his PhD at King's College where he studied uh, criminal and paramilitary groups in urban Brazil. Right, if I could 
um, the, turn to Matthew, who will give us uh, hold forth for ten minutes uh, on on uh, this topic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be with all, everyone today, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, a stimulating discussion of the the important issues that we've been asked to think about. So as I came into the field of policing reform issues uh, through post-Soviet studies, uh, I thought I would begin just by referencing a book that everyone who studies Russian reads at some point, which is Mikhail Bulgakov's Master and Margarita, uh, which is a, a novel set in Moscow in the 1930s in which the devil visits Moscow. And part of what makes the book so enjoyable is that it turns out that the devil is not purely evil. Uh, he's also capable of doing some um, unexpected good. And I think there are some applications of this insight to the study of police reform, um, which, to which I came through a background in political science, which led me to think about questions of regime transition and regime type. Um, and a lot of uh, the, the uh, research I've done and that I've become aware of over the years has focused on questions about what kinds of background political conditions facilitate certain kinds of uh, positive changes in policing. So in particular, uh, I became interested in the Russian police and their adaptation to a more open society in the years after the fall of the Soviet Union um, that was uh, less regimented, but also continued to feature different kinds of authoritarian rule. Um, so there, I think um, an important point that, that I'm gonna to touch on a bit further in this presentation is that um, we need to think beyond simply typologies of regimes um, grouped into authoritarian and democratic and think about the ways in which different kinds of political system influence policing. Um, I've also, uh, over the years, become interested in aspects of police reform in the Republic of Georgia, uh, in which in the early 2000s, a form of police initiative um, was undertaken that was highly centralized, draconian, and accompanied by a punitive approach to crime in general, and in particular organized crime, but that nonetheless produced a uh, significant improvement in the way that most citizens experienced important aspects of policing, including a dramatic reduction in corruption, as well as improved service and many aspects of, of police work. So how do findings like these um, square with theories of democratic policing, um, which have been brought to us by the likes of uh, Bailey, Manning, Loader, and many others? Um, this is a, a very important, valuable literature that, that helps us understand the kind of policing that is appropriate to a democratic society and thus provides benchmarks for evaluating both um, the, the police, both at static, static snapshots in time, but also over time. So as a way of evaluating changes and initiatives. And I think that some important insights that have come out of this literature that have continued to guide uh, those of us working in this field are um, thinking about ways that changes to policing, which we can call police reform, um, limit certain kinds of abuses, uh, promote the, the welfare and security of all members of society, and in a recent formulation by Andy Aitchison, um, in some cases can promote the democratic political order itself. Um, I would also distinguish police reform using the terms of uh, Erica Marat from what she calls mere police refurbishment, um, such as improvements in police skills or police equipment or working conditions. The uh, democratic policing literature uh, has inspired a lot of um, scholarship that examines the empirical unfolding of police reforms, but it does not necessarily tell us itself how we get to the reforms that we want, uh, or and it also does not necessarily clarify the association between um, large concepts such as democracy and particular good practices in policing, which turns out to be highly elusive. Uh, I've now been working in this field for about a decade, and uh, there is a very rich literature on police reform uh, around the world, which has produced a bewildering complexity of findings in terms of the kinds of reform measures that are associated with particular political phenomena. And in the remainder of my remarks, I'm going to be turning to the question about um, trying to understand what, what the findings so far suggest about three broad areas or three, three broad um, sources of influence on policing which I'll refer to as uh, regime types. Pardon me, let me rephrase that. About three broad questions that are of interest to us in the study of policing. So one of these is the question of how regime types influence policing. Another question that I think has emerged from the literature is 
there's a variety of public goods and public bads that um, we have discovered uh, in the context of international police reform. And finally, the importance of other modalities, so of, of factors outside of regimes and varieties of regimes that, imp that implicate the, the success of police reform initiatives. And I'll close by suggesting some directions for future research. If we think about democratic policing, um, one point that I think has become increasingly clear is that not only is not all policing in, in political um, societies that are organized to democracies itself democratic, so not all policing in democracies is democratic, but in addition, uh, it is also uncomfortably clear that authoritarian regimes can, can produce um, public goods in the form of improved policing um, that um, can be similar in particular limited ways to what we would like to see in democratic policing. Um, so I mentioned the example of Georgia above. Um, another example that has been studied widely in the literature is the um, police force of Singapore, uh, which was the product of that country's developmental authoritarian regime in the 1960s. A current doctoral student at the University of Toronto, Serdar San, is doing some fascinating research right now on the way that Turkey's military regime in the 1980s uh, created a much more um, modern, honest, and professional police force in part as a part of a process of neoliberal, neoliberal state retrenchment in which other aspects of the state were slimmed down. It's quite difficult when you come down to it to try to identify uh, broad generalities that seem to apply across um, all countries in the world or all contexts involving the influence of regimes on uh, policing. I think it is fair to say that only democracy makes possible a certain kind of open debate on the police that is uh, a debate in which um, everyone in society is free to participate openly and in an unconstrained manner and to, even if not necessarily uh, produce equal inputs on the final product of police reform, at least to share their views and make them known to the authorities. It's probably also fair to say that police and authoritarian regimes serve as an important, an important bulwark for the regime in a way that is at least in principle different from that in democracies, although that distinction often um, seems to become diminished when one um, pokes at it a bit further. Uh, beyond that, it is, I think, important to point out or to acknowledge that most policing activities don't necessarily implicate the survival of the regime, and that many obstacles to reform have to do with uh, features of particular institutions or, or societies that are not necessarily directly related to the uh, high-level characteristics of the state. So, for example, in some research I did some years ago with Nona Shaknazaryan on women in the Armenian police, um, the conclusion we reached was that the, the electoral authoritarian nature of the Armenian regime was not the reason why it had been difficult for women um, to, to become um, more fully integrated into the Armenian police and why the police were not um, well suited to serve the, the women of Armenia. So, uh, clearly, not all authoritarian regimes are created the same. They have different characteristics, and in particular contexts, they can produce certain kinds of improved policing. Another broad conclusion that I think emerges from the literature is that um, we need to specify clearly the variety of public goods and, and harms or bads that um, we are interested in understanding, and they are often associated with each other in ways that are surprising or, or unexpected. So, for example, in a paper that um, I co-authored with Prado and Wong some years ago, we found that uh, if one compares police in Brazil, China, and Russia, one sees that uh, while the police of Brazil are in some ways the most clearly the most violent, um, or at least they were at the time, um, there are other respects in which, say, the police of China are um, far more repressive on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, clearly much more oriented toward um, the maintenance of the regime and through undemocratic police methods. So uh, one can see positive evolutions in policing as for example, in the case of Brazil after the military dictatorship in which the use of police for direct political repression was eliminated. Um, while the uh, other aspects of extreme problems in policing such as severe police rights abuses and violence continue unabated. Um, in a recent paper by Slade et al on police reform in Kazakhstan, it was argued that the police of that country had uh, attempted to adopt US style zero tolerance policing, but that this, that this attempt had been a, a failure uh, 
um, largely because the nature of the relationship between the Kazakhstani government and the police did not really allow the government to impose a significant kind of um, uh, agenda for a reorientation of policing toward uh, heavy handed public order enforcement. Um, thinking about this finding, uh, I was struck by the fact that here, in some sense, uh, the, the failure of the regime to implement its, its, um, its preferred agenda was in a certain sense a plus um, for freedom in that it prevented Kazakhstan from pursuing a, a highly draconian uh, punitive policy or a punitive approach to policing that was pioneered in the United States. I also think it's worth pointing out that um, the modalities of abuse that we're interested in can vary. So um, going back to the post-Soviet region, um, the use of identity documents to control individual behavior and the way that police have been deployed in a number of post-Soviet countries, including Russia, to, um, to, to use uh, people's places of residence or their internal passports as a way of, um, of uh, repressing them politically, um, seems to have been largely eliminated in the country that I studied some years ago, Georgia, in which uh, the use of identity documents has become quite um, in line with Western European standards. At the same time, that does not mean that the use of police uh, in Georgia to affect political repression was eliminated, but rather simply that it took a different form. So I think the point here is that we need to be aware of modalities of abuse and the significance of particular police practices in different contexts. Um, and finally, it's also uh, um, necessary to acknowledge that not every authoritarian regime is always interested in every kind of repression or every kind of abuse. So um, it, is, it would be a fallacy to think that the, uh, every government that is not democratically elected uh, is always interested in carrying out extreme repression or extreme violence using the police at any given moment. I think an important finding that emerges from this literature over the last decade or, and more is that um, modalities beyond the, the actual nature of the regime have an important effect on the outcomes of police reform efforts or of uh, initiatives in policing. So an important aspect of this that's received a lot of attention recently is the question of oversight. So the, the forms of oversight that are emerged in different societies, including non-democratic ones, can indeed influence how policing um, evolves in positive and negative ways. Um, even police in the Republic of, People's Republic of China has oversight, and arguably that oversight is quite stringent. In contrast, looking at the problems of policing in the United States, particularly the issues of uh, extreme use of force and racial disparities in the application of force, um, a thought that I have recently been um, playing around with is that um, one might say that American police are arguably the most autonomous from political authorities, in the, at least in the developed world, and that um, many of the abuses that we associate with them have to do with their high level of autonomy from the state um, rather than their direct connection to uh, other um, governmental institutions. Uh, a similar aspect or a related aspect uh, of how the police are overseen has to do with the role of civil society in creating the conditions for them to be um, constantly in dialogue with uh, other members of society, which Erica Murat has written about in her recent book, uh, where she found that um, attempts to curtail police violence for most um, likely result in success, where they were accompanied by the cooperation of civil society organizations and not carried out in a hermetic manner by the state itself acting alone. Um, other, other examples of, of modalities that I think are important to consider in police reform or attendant circumstances have to do with legacy effects. So um, in an analysis of violent, uh, violence by the police, um, Erica France uh, found some years ago that um, military rule, even after it ends, continues to, um, to, continues to influence policing in the form of uh, highly militarized police that have uh, certain kinds of heavy-handed tactics um, and that these legacy effects of past regimes ling linger for many years. A, a final set of insights, I think, has to do with different kinds of actors and their involvement in police reform, and how they can promote or, or uh, impede its success. So uh, Yunilda Gomez has written, pardon me, Yunilda Gonzalez has written about the importance of reform coalitions in the context of Latin American policing, so the way that there has to be a, a certain political constellation with an empowered uh, opposition party that is 
capable of uh, capitalizing on problems in policing in order to create um, substantial reforms. Stephen Savage has written about the importance of police unions and their role in influencing how changes to policing are implemented. And finally, which I understand will be the topic of a future uh, roundtable, um, we have to think about the role of international, not only international funding, but also international pressure, as well as simply diffusion. So the diffusion of ideas and practices, because um, I think one point that emerges from the study of policing is that uh, much of what the police do and how they do it is ultimately not necessarily questioned in particular contexts, but has to do with particular epistemic communities that they belong to. So um, shared understandings about how policing should be carried out or what it means. So what do I think all this um, suggests for scholars of policing and those trying to use scholarship on policing to implement successful police reforms? I think what it points to is the need for, for mid-range theories that are, that are properly contextualized. Um, there is certainly room for high-level questions about the nature of regimes and their connection to police institutions. But we also need to be um, mindful of the limitations of that analysis and the importance of more contextual factors or modalities that I've just described. As well as finally, the question of the degree to which um, police institutions around the world are um, comparable. So what I mean by that is to be, the need to be alert to um, both the value of interregional comparisons, um, but also at the same time, the need to think about the effects of uh, being located in the same world region, uh, legacies of previous institutional arrangements, and how police forces um, can be grouped together or, or are related as um, have family resemblances um, in the regions in which they're situated. So I think that to the extent that, that I have a suggestion or an idea for, for other um, scholars who are interested in pursuing these questions or for policymakers, um, it is to, to um, think about the effects of these three broad um, categories of influences on police reform. And I will uh, leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Matthew. And uh, if I could ask, uh... Uh, Jyoti to to uh, speak to this theme as well. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, and and uh, sort of picking up from the last point that Matthew made, the importance of context becomes really important when you're talking about police reforms, and understanding the the, the entire setup within which these reforms are uh, planned, or at least um, trying to be introduced, is is really important. So I'm going to talk about police reforms um, in India and <clears throat> sort of flipping the topic or flipping the, the um, title of the seminar um, a bit. The title says, what makes police reforms succeed? I'm kind of going to analyze what has made police reforms fail in India. And that hopefully will give us some indication of uh, what are the challenges that need to be overcome if police reforms have to succeed. So. Um, just trying to share my screen. Um, let me know, please, if it's working. Working? Um, yes, it's fine. Thank you. So, um, so I'm going to talk about the current state of police reform in India. Um, just, just a very brief overview, um, how far it has uh, succeeded or not. Um, I'll present some reflections on the motivations for reform and theories um, that, that sort of explain whether or not police reforms succeed and, and if not, why not. Um, try to identify some of the challenges to reform in India and, and just a couple of points looking ahead. Um, so starting off with what governs Indian police. So the, uh, the policing in India is governed by the Police Act of 1861, which is a legacy of the British uh, colonial rule. Post, uh, post independence, the constitution of India has adopted a federal structure. So you've got certain areas of policy making that are the responsibility of the state and other uh, areas that are the responsibility of the center. Um, police and law and order is a state subject in India, which means all the laws and frameworks governing police uh, are the responsibility of the individual states. So there are 28 states and, and several union territories, and each state is responsible for the police in their um, jurisdiction. 
the the structure of the police service is also we have the elite cadre of uh, police officers who are at the senior ranks, uh, not only of state police services, but also of the central police organizations. That's the Indian Police Service, which is a civil service, uh, and officers are then allocated to various states, but the bulk of the police force in each state belongs to that state police force. Um, India is a democracy, but the accountability or the way democratic accountability is ensured is by um, the police being accountable to the political executive in the state and at the center. Why is there a need for reform in India? Well, um, there are lots of issues with, with the Indian police. Um, it's a highly politicized force. There's a, a remarkable lack of professionalism and rampant corruption. Um, the police uh, are trying really hard to shrug off its colonial antecedents. Um, it's, it's commonly said uh, one set of white sahibs were replaced by another set of brown sahibs. There's very much still uh, an us versus them attitude uh, as far as the police are concerned when they deal with the public. There is a need for greater accountability to the public. A lot of the accountability at present rests to the political executive. And so there is very little um, um, involvement of civil society. And there are a number of operational challenges uh, combined with the lack of resources. So there is a need for reforming policing in India and that is um, doubtless. Now, there have been several attempts uh, since the 19, late 1970s, several committees, national police commissions have been constituted to look into the area of police reforms and they have made um, at least six or seven really big com important committees and they've made recommendations that number from 50 to 450. Um, and and uh, the, the government has even, um, uh, set up um, uh, an, an executive committee to uh, look into creating a model police act. Now, again, as mentioned before, you cannot pass a, a, an act at the center. Each state government has to adopt this act and pass it for their own jurisdiction, which means getting 28 other players on board if they have to introduce these reforms. The, the biggest reform uh, movement um, or, or, or the one that has had the largest impact or elicited the maximum response has been this particular case of Prakash Singh versus the Union of India. Now, Mr. Prakash Singh is an ex very senior police officer who launched a public interest litigation um, and, and asked for police reforms, appealed to the Supreme Court of India in 1996. Uh, the Supreme Court um, looked into it, set up several committees to, to uh, look at specific aspects of what was being asked by Mr. Prakash Singh. And it, in its landmark judgment in 2006, um, sort of issued seven directives for the states to be setting up. So interestingly, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the political executive, but this was the reform that was driven by the judiciary. And uh, what they what the, the the directives were mainly um, around setting up of a police establishment uh, board that would look at um, tenures and postings of police officers because that was the biggest um, way in which uh, the politicians controlled police officers. Setting up of a complaints authority, investigation, separation of investigation and law and order functions, and setting up of state. Uh, security councils and national security councils. So the thrust of these reforms were twofold. One was organizational reform that is in the form of protection from political interference. So uh, what these reforms sought to do is, is to ensure security of tenure to, um, so that uh, officers can be operationally independent and separation of functions. Again, it was hoped that by separating out the investigation from law and order, it would make the police more efficient and more professional uh, and, and allow for less corruption. 
The other area that, that the reforms sought to address was tackling corruption and so setting up of complaints mechanisms and various accountability mechanisms was the thrust of these reforms. So 14 years on, what has been the progress? Since the judgment in 2006, um, a, a report by the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative in 2020 found that of the 22 states, 28 states, a mere two states have complied with the requirements. If we take um, any one particular state, uh, let's take the example of Maharashtra, uh, where Mumbai is, where I come from. Um, this is um, an example of the kind of report um, that, that uh, on the progress of these <clears throat> reforms. And as you can see, the state is non-compliant on each one of these dimensions. What, what is very clear is the state has made token attempts at setting up sort of bodies that, um, that seemingly are establishment boards or complaints authorities, but these are mere window dressing and are essentially toothless because they don't have any powers to enforce their decisions. So they remain merely advisory bodies with where you know, their voice doesn't have much of um, uh, much resonance with the establishment. What is the impact of this kind of um, non-compliance uh, with uh, reform requirements. Um, the, 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 the result is the kind of chaos we saw in Mumbai just last month where the police commissioner was uh, very summarily transferred out within his two-year tenure period. And um, this is because the home, there was some sort of differences between the home uh, minister, state home minister, and the commissioner of police. And so uh, some sort of alleged um, mis mishandling of terrorist threats was the ostensible excuse, but this person was shifted out. He in turn came back and alleged that the Home Minister had been asking his officers to collect um, sort of extortion money from or protection money from bars and um, uh, uh, da dance bars in, in, in Mumbai to the extent of 100 million rupees. Now this has resulted in, um, in national agencies coming in to investigate these alleg allegations of corruptions against the Home Minister. He's had to resign. Uh, in turn, there have been a number of police officers who have lodged complaints against their senior police officers. Um, again, allegations of corruption. So it's kind of a real mess and an embarrassment where you could clearly see that differences between the senior leadership and political powers that be has led to um, this kind of, um, well, um, a mess is all I can call it. So now if you're thinking about impetus for reforms, we can say uh, impetus for reforms can come from within, that is internal to the organization, um, and this can be of two kinds. It can be top down, so led by the leadership or bottom up where there is a need felt within the organization to bring about change in the way they uh, operate. Um, or it could be, and this is the kind of, um, um, of, of um, reform that Bailey is talking about um, and, and is basically talking about reforms in the US where a lot of the reforms are externally driven. They are um, as a result of um, some kind of knee-jerk response to scandals. So you can think of the NAP Commission in NYPD, or you can look at the McPherson report in uh, looking into, into institutional racism in the Met Police. So these are the ones that then generate calls for reform or it could be an internal uh, generated where the police organization decides that they want to move over to a new way of operating. So moving over to community policing or uh, a problem oriented policing model might be an internally driven um, motivation for reform. Um, 
the engine for police reforms in India very clearly was externally driven. Um, there was some support from ex-police officers or from interested lobbies. Uh, and the, again, the demand for reform was not evidence-based, but, but people felt that these were areas that needed addressing. Um, all of these calls for reform were focused more on setting up of external governance and accountability structures. And, and, and the thrust of the uh, uh, demand for reforms was grounded in the belief that as long as the police can be made independent of political control, all problems will be resolved. So the, the solution is in better laws and better laws will lead to better policing almost automatically. And we can, we can kind of uh, immediately see some of the flaws in, in that kind of thinking. Another set, step back again, referring to some of the work Gonzalez did, which, which Matthew talked about, um, looking at uh, reform in Latin America. Um, one of the issues that Gonzalez talks about is um, in Latin America, reform is defined as the enactment of written policy intended to permanently change internal structures, rules, or practices within an entire organization. And, and because it means such a big um, overarching change, there has been very little reform in Latin America and so, so in India over the last 75 years since independence. Similar to India, um, there the concept of reform uh, in Latin America see, still seems to me to be about getting the structure right and not really on improving capacity or service to the public. She talks about what motivates institutional change, which is very much uh, pressures from political opponents and uh, united civil society uh, uh, demands. And where there is fragmented demand, um, very often reform doesn't happen because there is no electoral advantage in bringing about those reforms. Similarly, Bourdieu's concept of field and habitus, where Chan talks about if change has to come about, it can't merely be within the habitus, within internal to the organization, there needs to be external support. Similarly, if impetus for change is coming from outside, it needs to have insider buy-in, stakeholder buy-in, otherwise it's not going to work out. So thinking about police reform from these two angles, um, Skogan then goes on to talk about why reforms fail. And uh, while he's talking mainly about reforms in Western countries, where a lot of these reforms might probably be internally driven or focused on the way in which the police conduct their business, uh, some of the reasons for why he says reforms fail to catch on or fail to um, be sustained are, are a number of these. If you apply them to the Indian context, then one of the main reasons why reforms have failed in India is because of the political resistance. There, um, there doesn't seem to be any kind of advantage for the politicians to change things, um, to change the status quo, which seems to benefit them. Internal culture, again, internally, there is, seems to be very little impetus to change because um, the senior leadership, again, are, um, there isn't much, the, the status quo is quite comfortable. And there has been a complete lack of public consultation for any of the reforms, uh, driving any of the reforms in India. So if you think about what are the structural uh, factors, so you can think about barriers to reform at three levels. At the macro level, you've got structural challenges in India, which is widespread corruption. The center has very little control on state's powers. Um, there's very poor, poor public participation in policy making. The public is, is largely indifferent and apathetic and status quo confers power, but reform brings very little advantage. At the institutional level, there is very strong politicization of the leadership. There are cultural barriers and um, the organization as such does not have a stake in this. It, it, it actually makes them feel that they are under attack. They are being scrutinized. There's something wrong. They, they are not being given the responsibility. And so there is no stake in trying to, um, trying to engender reform on, on the, along the lines that have been suggested. 
by the Supreme Court directive. And at the individual factors, individuals themselves don't are not confident that if, if these reforms do come about, they will apply equally to everyone. So they'll reap the benefits of these, um, of these reforms and they're unconvinced that, um, that, that, that the inherent politicization that exists within the force will disappear automatically. So finally, looking ahead, um, I mean, I think there is a question of whether, therefore, in countries like India, developing democrac democ democracies, whether the focus should be on changing the structure or whether the police should take charge of the reform movement for themselves and think about the way in which they conduct business. So whether it's about frameworks or whether it's about their operational practice. Again, there is a need to, to, to think about whether reform needs to be externally driven or whether it can be internally driven with this desire. We've looked at a lot of organizational change and how that comes about uh, when it's internally driven. Again, should reform be law-based or should it be practice-based? Again, do we need laws to change for every time you want to change the way you conduct business? That's a question police leaders need to answer. And finally, do we need wholesale reform? And so you wait until there is this massive um, groundbreaking change or whether reform can be introduced piecemeal, gradually in tiny increments. And the final thought I had was involvement of stakeholders, both internal actors and civil society is paramount for democratic change. If you think of reform movements um, and take the analogy of, uh, take the horse racing analogy with the racehorse being reform, then while most of the world is thinking about improving the way the race is won, India is still thinking about how to get the horse off the starting blocks. We're still stuck there. We haven't yet started that reform movement. And I think some of these issues might help the police internally to think about how they can bring about change without really waiting for the larger structure to, to drive that change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I could ask uh, Cathy to, to uh, speak, please. Hi. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'm going to, um, the United States is, is at a very different place than India. Um, what the United States experienced, for instance, in LA in giving uh, police autonomy to stop corruption ended up creating a police force that was out of control. So. For in the United States, the big issue is who controls the police, who gives them orders, um, what, what are the demands. Um, policing is local and it's political. Um, there is a movement right now to get uh, federal uh, standards so that the federal government can enforce uh, those basic issues of sanctity of life. Um, that local governments um, are sometimes unwilling to do. So let me just say that um, there, ha there has actually been a big improvement in policing. Um, for what one not has to understand about the United States is that the police forces um, were enforced segregation for a very long time, and not only in the South, but in the North. Um, they were extremely brutal. Uh, people could be killed for absolutely nothing. Um, and almost every riot in New York and in the United States were always sparked by unjust police killings. So as early as, you know, there was a 1935 riot in New York, 1945 riot was sparked because a, um, a, a returning soldier, um, a black soldier saw the police abusing a woman um, stepped in to help and was shot. Um, there, James Baldwin was involved in these stories where grapefruits fell on the floor of a, um, a, a fruit market and kids were playing with it. The owner 
uh, whistle calls whistles at them. The police come running, and they immediately uh, not only do they start shooting, they grab two bystanders, bring them to police station, and beat them almost to death, uh, leading Baldwin to say, um, "The only way to police a ghetto is oppressive." So compared to what it was, the high levels of police killings in the United States compared to other uh, developed countries um, is not unusual. Um, and the changes have happened gradually over time. And there have been successes and reversals. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, so social movements in New York City and some of the accomplishments. I'll talk a little bit about a few other cities that have accomplished, and then I think I'll talk a, a lot about, um, if I have time, uh, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. So in New York City, um, organizations had been active pushing for police reform very early. That includes the NAACP, uh, civil rights organizations, the Civil Rights Congress, and the Communist Party. Um, they, after the 1945 riot, they were able to get LaGuardia to um, integrate the police forces, which up until that time had been completely white. Uh, LaGuardia had called in black MPs um, to, to control the riot and then eventually expanded that, integrated them into the police. That was still only 600 policemen. By the 1990s, you still only had 5% of the police that weren't white. But the biggest reform movement really comes in the 60s. And it comes in New York by way of not only New York riots, which occurred both in 1964, which was the first of the 60s riots. Um, again, a, a killing, a police killing of a high school student um, who was horsing around with his friends um, and irritated a janitor who sprayed them with water and the kids um, taunted him, you know, with claims that he was similar to uh, the uh, use of water cannons against civil rights protesters in the South. And a policeman heard and came running up and shot the young, uh, one of the high school students. Um, and the riot actually started peacefully. Uh, mothers, families went to the police station to protest and the police came out um, attacking them, pushing them back, shooting at them and led to a, a rampage first in starting East Harlem, then West Harlem, moving out to Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy. Um, but it wasn't as long as or brutal as a riot became. There was also another significant riot in New York in 1967, which um, was a Puerto Rican riot of Puerto Rican neighborhoods, again, for the killing of a young Puerto Rican uh, man. In fact, almost every riot in the 60s was triggered by the killing of an unarmed minority youth. Uh, Puerto Ricans are often left out of this story, um, but they were not left out of the killings. Um, so Lyndon Johnson decided to convene a commission which was, which was called the Kerner Commission to investigate the causes of riots. And what they found was that the main trigger was police killings, that riots occurred in neighborhoods where the relationship between the police and the community was so toxic as to be explosive. Um, and the vice chair of the Kerner Commission was Mayor Lynn's, who be, John Lindsay, who became Mayor Lindsay. Um, and as mayor, he decided to address the root cause, what he felt was of all of the explosions of the 1960s. And he introduced really remarkable reforms. If you think about the 60s, it's also a story, not only of success, but also how easy those reforms are to be reversed. But he initiated the initial idea of community policing, which has been, was perverted by uh, Bratton and other violent police um, into what they called quality of life policing. But for Lindsay, what it meant was one, 
police had no rights to kill anyone unless another citizen's life was in danger. In fact, it was not an excuse to use lethal violence if the policeman's life was in danger. Uh, what Lindsay said, and later his chief McNamara said, was that if you um, feel in danger, you should find a, a place of safety, back out and call for reinforcements, because we don't hire you to protect yourself. Your job is to protect the citizenry. And that was extremely important. It's one of the reasons that New York City was almost the only major city in 1968 after the assassination of Martin Luther King to be quiet. Um, there were no outbursts in New York. Lindsay moved through the city. But the other thing he did, which was really interesting and had long-term consequences, was to believe in community organizations and getting the community themselves involved in policing. And so he hired young youth that had been involved in these uprisings in New York as peacekeepers and as communication liaisons with the mayor's office. Um, he supported a wide array of community organizations um, and he did everything, you know, things like have buses out to the parks and suburbs outside the city for youths. He had uh, free films. Um, and these organizations uh, became these, gave birth to very skilled organizers. Um, in fact, Lindsay himself, because of budgetary reasons, decided to defund all of these organizations one summer. And the young people decided to put their organizing skills to action and they organized, they, built big barricades um, uh, on the major highways around the city and leading to the city. They set um, them on fire. They swept up garbage in the streets and set it on fire and Lindsay backed down. Um, and these, <laughs> these young people began to form new organizations, radical organizations. The first radical organization actually precedes the riots, which is in 1966, uh, the Real Great Society is being formed and it's a group, it's a street gang that becomes a political organization. Um, it's simultaneous to the emergence of the Panthers in Old Oakland um, and it's Puerto Rican. It, it's birth, it gave birth in the Lower East Side. Out of the big protests against Lindsay emerged um, another Puerto Rican activist organization called the Young Lords. Uh, the Young Lords was a outgrowth and admirer of the Young Lords in Chicago, which were the first Young Lords formed by Chacha Quibenes, who had a close relationship with Fred Hampton, uh, who was the head of the Black Panthers in Chicago and was assassinated by police. But in New York, uh, young people traveled to Chicago, got permission, and they became community organizers. So by 1973, Lindsay is, loses his election and policing reform back to square one. But young people now in neighborhoods are getting the organizational skills to combat it. And one of the things Young Lords did is create what was called Puerto Rican Congress for Human Rights and underneath was called the Justice Committee. And the Justice Committee was dedicated to helping the families whose children had been killed by police or whose brothers had been killed by police or whose parents had been killed by police um, get justice for their kids. Um, and they also started organizing communities. Um, they became a major force in reducing crime in communities, um, creating networks in those communities. And they developed what I called my book a standard nonviolent repertoire for addressing police violence, which was basically at any time a parent lost their child, a young, a young Lords, the Justice Committee would call them and offer them a path to justice. And that included uh, street actions, uh, large marches down Fifth Avenue, um, 
meetings with local councilmen, sit-ins at police plaza. It also included lawyers for civil suits because that was had just opened up. And they began suing the city if the district attorneys, which was the local form of justice in the United States, did not indict. And I will say one of the important recent reforms, um, both in New York, Newark, and even uh, in Minnesota in terms of George Floyd is to take prosecutorial discretion away from local district attorneys who work and depend with and depend on local police. And so DAs almost never indict. Um, DAs that do indict, like the DA in Philadelphia, are often um, receive a lot of backlash from the police who then uh, refuse to uh, investigate homicides, who then uh, launch political campaigns. Um, and so as long as the district attorney is in charge of prosecute, prosecuting uh, officers who kill, especially unarmed people, we, we rarely see justice. What the Young Lords or the Justice Committee offered families was a path to civil suits. Unfortunately, the resolution of civil suits became routine by the city. So by the aughts, uh, New York City was settling $100 million a year uh, for civil suits for families whose kids or other family members had been killed by police. Um, something similar, Baltimore was spending 6 million a year, but cities were settling with families and they were not doing anything to address police violence as a whole. Um, and activists began to feel like they were spinning their wheels. Um, they were working hard to get justice in individual cases. Of course, for the families, it was never justice. Almost every family I knew uh, used the money from the settlement to form a new activist group um, that was organizing around uh, police violence. Um, so the Justice Committee and other organizers realized that they had to seek a systemic solution. Um, and they started doing so around the same time, um, perhaps coincidentally, as Black Lives Matter become uh, important. So in New York, Justice Committee is looking for statewide solutions. In Ferguson, in which you've had riots, um, Black Lives Matter starts publicizing this at a national level. Um, local activists had not really considered national level, um, except for the fact that they pursued federal indictments and were more successful at federal indictments for violating civil rights than they were at homicides. So, uh, sorry. so what happens in New York is they get the governor to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate every case in New York State where uh, police kill someone unarmed. And that does dramatically bring down the rates of killing unarmed people. Uh, New Jersey follows, and after the killing of uh, George Floyd, so does Minnesota. Uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison takes the case away from the district attorney and decides to prosecute it himself, his office. And that was one of the remarkable um, changes that led to the conviction of George Floyd for murder. Um, almost unheard of. Um, since 2005, there's been about a thousand killings across the country a year. Um, and there's only been seven cases where police were prosecuted for homicide. Um, and I don't know of any other case where they were convicted of murder. Um, but the other important aspect of these changes besides seeking 
uh, state level or even national level accountability changes, which is really, really important, is that nine police officers testified against Chauvin. That, again, is almost unheard of. Uh, the infamous blue wall of silence means that even police officers who are hate the murderer, who are themselves victims, because not enough is being talked about how many of these police officers who kill unarmed people in the communities also kill or brutalize um, policemen of color. Uh, the killings are usually justified as um, he was out of uniform. I didn't know him. Um, I know a black policeman who said that his own colleagues, if he wasn't wearing his uniform, didn't recognize him. But sometimes they were, you know, overtly racist beatings. In one case um, that I knew of, the police had uh, assassinated two young people. Um, forcing them to lie on the ground and then shooting them with multiple bullets. Uh, those same police officers, one of whom had been Giuliani's bodyguard, went on to um, first beat a black police officer outside a restaurant where the police had gathered um, to raise funds for another police officers. Um, and when an, a Latino officer, Chavestre, intervened to protect Thompson, he was beaten so brutally that he has a severe brain damage, an IQ now of 65 and can barely function. So why do police protect their own? Why is it that police who are themselves victims of sadistic, murderous and racist police officers, why don't they inform on that? And the problem is, is that it's dangerous for them. We know that from Serpico, who was um, set up for a drug bust in which his, the other officers abandoned him and allowed him to be shot in the head. And so one of the newest ways people are thinking about um, addressing police violence is whistleblower, whistleblower, um, whistleblower um, legislation for police themselves. It would include protection of police officers who report their of the other officers. It would include um, protection for witnesses, protections for families. Um, and there are already, uh, I think 31 police officers, um, a, a number of uh, organizations of Black police that have signed on to push this legislation. So one of the most important things in terms of police reform is accountability. How do you hold these officers accountable? And I would really guess that in the Chauvin case that he was brutalized other police, that they really disliked him. You never see that level of willingness of police at every level from trainers to commanders to say in court that there was no justification for the killing of George Floyd. Um, Chauvin had his knee into the man's neck on the ground for almost 10 minutes, nine and a half minutes, while the entire crowd begged him, begged him to let the man live. What was important about the George Floyd case is that it was filmed. Um, one of the families I worked with had a similar incident in which uh, their son was choked to death by a police officer. Chauvin, by the way, had 17 excesses, excessive force or violence complaints against him. Uh, Francis Labadie in New York had 12, and he also choked to death a young man who was playing football with his friends and, and brothers and the football hit his, hit Lavadi's car. And while the brothers begged for his life, he was choked to death. And in that case, um, the police cooked up a story um, about uh, Anthony uh, 
bias getting up and walking away. And it was a police officer, the only one who was a woman who actually broke the blue wall of silence and said that the police had cooked up the story in the parking lot and that's not how it happened. And bias never got up. Uh, the medical examiner said that his um, windpipe was crushed and it was a judge trial and the judge said, there's been a nest of perjury in this courtroom but they haven't proved beyond reasonable doubt that it was the choking that killed him. And he still, uh, the police still got off, although the community groups then uh, pursued federal indictments. And a federal judge, uh, Judith Scheinlin, um, not only gave him maximum penalty, which was only seven years for violating the civil rights of somebody they killed, um, but Scheinlin went on to rule in the case of stop and frisk. Um, she was the judge who said that stop and frisk in New York City was unconstitutional. Okay, so excuse me, Kathy, because sorry. we have two more speakers, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little so concerned. Sorry. Okay, oh dear, oh God, okay. I'll have to let it go. There was so much more I wanted to say, but I'll answer in questions. Perhaps, okay, thank you very much, thanks. Oops, could I ask Yonda, please, thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Chris. So just as Kathy said that policing and police reform in the US is in a different place um, to what it is in India, I'll start right off the bat by saying that policing and police reform in South Africa is in quite a different place from the US and closer to the dynamics of where India is. Um, in, answering, in answering the question of the topic of today's discussion, I found myself problematizing what we believe um, successful police reform is who decides what success is in these terms and for whom it is deemed successful. In my uh, research and writing on police militarization in post-apartheid South Africa and comparative research with police militarization in Brazil, I wrote about the similarities and differences in the history and processes of militarization in both of those countries. The broad similarities lie in the rise of militarized policing in both countries and contexts in, um, in response to rising crime levels, high levels of drug and gang violence, and social, political, and capital pressures in these two highly influential state actors in the global south. One might not think of the term I'm of the not turn sure towards if this is me or I think we lost you there for a second. Oh, am I back? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll I'll just start from the last sentence. Um, the broad similarities lie in the rise of militarized policing in both countries and contexts um, in response to rising crime levels, high levels of uh, drug and gang violence, and social, political, and capital pressures in these two highly influential state actors in the global south. One might not think of the turn towards uh, militarized policing as police reform, but in a way it is. Police reform isn't one, one dimensional or one directional. And criminologists like uh, Garth Den Heyer theorize and argue that police militarization can in fact be the professionalization or the evolution of policing and not as others do, that it is the conflation of the culture, practices and functions of the police and military. Um, in both Brazil and South Africa, there's a long history of militarized policing during the dictator dictatorship in Brazil and during apartheid in South Africa. And since then, both countries have followed paths in reforming their modern police services in very distinct directions. The process of police reform itself has, re has resulted in a professionalized, but also more explicitly militarized police response to high levels of violent crime in the favelas of Brazil's uh, largest cities in Rio de Janeiro uh, and Sao Paulo. Broadly speaking, nationwide reforms in Brazil have previously been aimed at upgrading police professionalism, tightening standards for police operations, improving managerial practices, and enhancing um, the life uh, of police officers in the lower ranks, as well as inculcating uh, greater respect for citizens' rights through training. In South Africa, sweeping reform in the early and mid 1990s, as apartheid ended and democracy dawned, saw the implementation of police reform measures that were both internal and external. Internal measures included the depoliticization of the police service, increased accountability to the community, the establishment of improved and effective um, management practices, the reform of, um, of police training, and the racial integration of the police service across the old SAP, former anti-apartheid militant groups, and the homeland um, or Bantustan policing agencies. 
external measures, which were um, important and key to, drain, to gaining the trust of the public, included improving police and community relations, removing all forms of discrimination within and by the police service towards communities, and adapting a new uh, mindset of a human rights-based ethos to policing and a community-centered approach. Um, this also included restoring uh, discipline and morale amongst uh, police personnel. So reform processes um, in countries like South Africa and Brazil are deeply difficult precisely because of the hundreds of years of colonial history and the origins of policing institutions in many settler colonial states, um, such as these two countries. This is also something that uh, Matthew mentioned as legacy effects, um, particularly of uh, colonial history um, and military uh, history and policing. So where police forces, or in the case of South Africa, the new and reformed police services, have long histories of being institutions of suppression and repression against liberation movements or the enforcers of dictatorships or of former colonial powers, policing itself is deeply uh, tied to class, capital, and state interests, and therefore at odds with the interests of labor, liberation, and other popular social movements. In these um, circumstances, the difficult work of police reform at an institutional and structural level is and can be compromised or undermined by pressures brought on by slow economic growth, rising poverty and inequality, or other socioeconomic pressure. This puts the larger reform efforts at odds with the realities of policing at the station level, especially in poor communities that bear the brunt of the, afore uh, of the aforementioned pressures. And at this point, um, this is where police reform that is envisioned in the way that Brazil and South Africa have envisioned it in the past, give, gives way to police reform that militarizes or hardens in response to these political, socio-political pressures and the threat of rising violent crime. Again, these circumstances and the case studies of many different countries, not just the two that I have mentioned, therefore call into question what we deem to be successful police reform. One could easily argue that South Africa is a successful model of police reform because our now police service is materially different to what it was in our colonial era and during apartheid. One could make the same argument for the police forces in Nigeria and Kenya, which both re uh, repealed the legislative instruments that gave the police their mandates during the colonial era and replaced them with new legislation that made their police institutions more responsive and accountable to communities and to the legislative branch um, of their governments. But a qualitative assessment of policing in those uh, countries and in others suggests otherwise. This has been true for a long time in many countries, and this point was sharply illustrated um, by policing during the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting lockdowns in South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Brazil, and many other countries where social, uh, social political and legal police reformed could be deemed successful, but also where police agencies enforced, uh, uh, enforced incredibly harsh lockdowns and pandemic restrictions, resulting in several cases of police brutality rampant police violence, and in some cases, the deaths of ordinary citizens. It is no surprise then that there were popular protests in Kenya over police um, abuse and violence in uh, June 2020 that demanded accountability for police officers who abused their power and authority in the early months of that country's lockdown, or that there, were large or that there was a large public outcry over the killing of Collins Causa and 10 other people at the hands of the military and police in South Africa in the first three months of the country's highest level of lockdown, or that there was a large popular movement called NSARS in Nigeria in October uh, 2020 in response to repeated accusations of police abuse by the special um, anti-robbery squad of the Nigerian police. Or in Brazil, um, where despite a Supreme Court ruling that banned police operations in favelas, there were still thousands of deaths due to uh, police action reported in 2020. In the past year, what we've seen is that popular protest and social movements can and have moved the needle on qualitative police reform in, in recent years. And this is due to the realization that political processes, decolonization and democratic reform and, and consolidation can only offer a certain level of police and security reform, but it is not complete in and of itself. Police reform can and should be thought of as a political and public policy process but also as a whole of society change that is sensitive to backsliding and a return to repressive practices where poverty, inequality, high unemployment and high crime levels can compound, complicate and undermine police practice that answers to the people and not to the state um, or capital or to other vested interests. In conclusion, 
and to answer what makes police reform and police uh, reform movement successful. I would say that a sustained pressure for and a vigilance over reform efforts that are not, at, that are not only at the high level of leadership of police structures um, uh, is a key element. Successful movements and reform efforts require years of tangible and material reform and change that cannot start and end with legal and policy provisions alone, but that also actually change police practice that has been learned, implemented, and repeated over centuries. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, let me hand it over to our discussant, Andrea, for uh, a, a brief um, uh, uh, set of insights on the on the speech, the talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and uh, I gotta say thanks to uh, everyone for their for their insights. It has been a very interesting panel. Uh, I want to thank again uh, uh, Liam Oshi and Zoa Basin for organizing this event as well as well the past ones and the next one uh, that is going to come on donors. Um, I'll try to be quick so that we have uh, some meaningful time for Q&As coming from the public. So I'll try to offer just a few remarks based on, uh, on, um, on what we have heard so far. I tried to pick up a few common points that seem to be pretty important in this discussion. It's uh, one of the great things about this panel is how wide it is. So we've touched on uh, I'm sure, like basically almost all the regions in the globe, we got um, we got examples from the US, from Brazil, from India, from South Africa, from Russia and Georgia, and broadly the post-Soviet region. Um, and here, what it seems, um, I think this panel poses from one point of view, uh, more questions than answers on police reforms and what police reforms are and what makes them successful. Which is actually a good thing if you think about it. It's a, it's kind of a, like several sparks to uh, theoretical and also practical reasoning uh, around what we're talking about when we're talking about police reforms. So this seems to be a pretty important question. Um, but first, like one point that seems common to me across this this these uh, uh, these talks um, is the importance of context and the context here is meant as a geographical context um so uh well like uh, badly what country we're talking about what are the characteristics of the region um of course the social cultural contexts um and the historical context and one thing that i noticed is of course there is an issue of historical context concerning um well, the, the history of policing and of the repressive, oppressive use of policing. So if we think about India, uh, we can think about colonial uh, laws. If we think about South Africa, we can think about apartheid. Um, if we think about the post-Soviet region, of course, we have the whole uh, totalitarian legacy of the Soviet system. But then um, it's also an historical context of protest, of opposition. And this came um, in this. This is pretty important. This came up pretty uh, evidently in uh, Katie's talk, and how these activism that we see now and they may become very um, consequential and important and impactful now actually has a history behind. Especially if we look locally at the case of New York City, it's something that has been built decades uh, in that has been decades in the coming and built. Um, with different goals in mind. John Lindsay was not trying to get a police reform movement uh, made as he made contacts with those Puerto Rican communities. A second thing that I uh, have noticed, and it's not really uh, optimistic, uh, is there are not many examples of successful reforms. There are quite a few actually. Um, if you think about, it has been mentioned about Georgia, that was also like part of the topic, uh, there was a talk about that in the, in the past event. Um, and of course, um, you know, there are, there are some, Katie was mentioning some successes and reversals, um, but then uh, um, unfortunately there's a lot of setbacks and a lot of uh, reforms that don't even start. So if you think back about Jyoti's uh, great, you know, presentation. Um, even something that comes from one of the main 
institutions in the country, the Supreme Court, um, you know, the states have managed to kind of, you know, avoid and just, you know, put some window dressing, some token reforms, and, and that's it. So um, I think these issue regarding successful reforms um, and, uh, you know, why don't we have more successful reforms need some investigation. And this leads me to my final point, which is really linked to what Ziando was saying um, about what does reform mean? And actually that came up uh, in a few different ways across the talks. So um, Giotti was mentioning the token measures that Indian states tended to you know, introduce. Um, Matthew mentioned the idea of police refurbishment, which is not the same as police reform. And then Zianda, of course, was talking about militarization, which is, we could call it, of course, it has been seen as police professionalization. Um, we can think about police upgrading, police buffing. Maybe, you know, buffing the police, upgrading the police, it's not what we want, if that means, uh, you know, giving tanks or like, well, armored vehicles and, you know, uh, weapons of war to the police and thinking that will solve the issue. Um, so it's really, there is a really like a hanging question regarding what does, um, what does reform actually mean? And of course that influences how we uh, assess its success and how possibly how radical the reform needs to be. And what is, maybe it's more of a question of the direction of the reform rather than the just the actual occurrence of change. So these seem to me like ideas that came out from the talks. And I have, a, I have quite a few questions, but I will, I will limit myself to two um, because of course we have our, our, our listeners. Um, first, this is one question that, um, uh, I don't know, I find it interesting is what can the global South teach to the global north? And this is really, these two questions are for everyone because I think everyone can, can respond. And although the global south is marked by, for example, colonial legacies, which may lead some people to say, well, it's not that much because of course the importance of context. So, you know, the colonial context is not the same in the global south as in the global north. But then if you think about how states emerged in the first place, they can even be seen, maybe it's a little bit radical, but as colonizers of their own population, at least at the start. So I think, uh, in, I think in general, uh, and in this issue as well, there may be some uh, globe south to north kind of lessons. And then there is a question about dialogue with police officers, which I think speaks to the, um, the internal side of reform, which was also like a topic that was mentioned across the, across the panel. So there are, I've seen that in, in my research as well, uh, and it has been mentioned by a few people. For example, Katie was mentioning the police officers who came up uh, to testify against Derek Chauvin. There are police officers within police forces that are open to reform, they're supporting reform even. How do we involve them, you know, as a way also to bridge maybe the gap between civil society, communities, and the police forces? So thank you so much again, and uh, I'm done here. Great, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, if I can uh, first ask um, the um, rest of the panel to, to put their videos on for the Q&A, that would be useful, I think. And I'm going to hand things over to Liam, who's going to uh, take us through to the final uh, point, uh, portion because I have to sign off in, in a, a few minutes, but I'll, I'll sit, in, sit in the background till and hand it over to Liam who will handle the Q&A side of things. Liam, can you turn your, your camera on? I'm just waiting for Dave to... Great, there we are. Um, well, thank you and thank you very much to our, our panelists. And unfortunately we have uh, very little time for, for Q&A. Um, and I know that a number of people have to go. So I'm going to pick one of the questions and um, for, for Zeander, which is the question by Irvin. Um, and essentially the question I, I, I'm reading it is, should police reform focus on the police or should it also focus on alternatives to the police? Um, so I'll put that over to Zeander and I'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap up afterwards. Um, over to Zeander. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, um, uh, sort of nuanced uh, question and conversation to have, uh, given the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Irvin mentions both South Africa and the US uh, 
um, and we're in very different positions, I think, um, as countries, as you know, political systems, um, and as societies, really. Um, but if I were to sort of cheat and, and try and answer the question uh, uh, all in all, I think it would be, um, you know, the idea of, of trying to almost combine both the idea of moving forward with police um, and at the same time alternatives to police. Um, in many communities in South Africa, the issue is um, not necessarily over policing or over criminalization, but that there is a lack of presence of the police. Um, and this leads to uh, what is sort of seen as very destabilizing um, uh, social structures, but at the same time, uh, rampant crime. So the, the idea that, you know, that, the, that there can be alternatives to police, but where there isn't um, any sort of semblance of, of safety or community safety um, means that I think both the, the issues need to be tackled from both um, angles. That's quite different in the US and in a lot of communities and, and country, uh, uh, states in the US um, where there is the problem of, of over criminalization and over policing. And so in that sense, I don't think that there's a good um, or hard and fast answer um, of either or. Um, it really becomes a, um, a sort of multi-pronged um, issue um, that, that is really quite a wicked problem, but at the same time, um, you know, this is, these are issues and problems that are informed by hundreds of years of history. Great, thank you. I think we've got time for one more question, which I'm going to try and squeeze in, um, which is from Kurt. And Kurt's question is, should police reform be aligned to national security priorities, which I think is quite interesting given the discussion on militarization. Um, pros and cons. Matt, if you can somehow put an answer together in a very short period of time, uh, that would be fine. I think that's a fascinating question and I, I can't really do it justice. Um, perhaps the way that I would approach it is that as one positive trend I see in, in um, both the study of policing and the way that people think about democratic transitions is that it's now understood that, that policing is a, a separate realm from, from representative institutions. So simply creating representative institutions or making them more democratic um, does not necessarily affect policing um, either in positive ways or in some cases in negative ways. And the example is often given of Brazil where the democratic transition really failed to um, reduce police brutality. So I think, I think my answer to the question would be, uh, if what's meant is that should we see policing as an important locus where people's um, rights are, are guaranteed um, or need to be guaranteed, and that the institutional design of police is separate from other aspects of uh, a country's political institutions, then absolutely yes. Great. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Quite a complex question and not very much time. Um, we do have some cap capacity to go over for five, 10 minutes if people have time. Of course, if you don't, you're welcome to, um, to go on. Um, what I'm going to do though is just use the, the question that Andrea had and, and ask two more questions. That's, oh, the same question to the remaining two panelists, which is what lessons do you think the Global South can uh, has for police reform in the Global North? So I'll go over to Jyoti and then to Cathy and then we'll wrap up. And uh, yeah, if you could just spend a couple of minutes answering that question. Again, it's a complex one, but uh, we'll be interested in your thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Um, I, I think what what the Global South can offer is, is just understanding how they can introduce reforms within the limitations placed in them by the wider social structural factors that are not, not supportive of reforms. And, and so it's just a question of, do we wait for that legal and, uh, and, and policy change that Zianda was talking about that might change on paper the, the, the form of policing, but not really the practice. And so it's, it's, it's this, it's making those kinds of decisions about whether you want wholesale reform or whether you want piecemeal reform. And I think that's, in the sense, that's what the Global South offers is, is just the sheer scale of the challenge of bringing about wholesale reform might encourage internal bottom up desire for reform within the police service led by uh, a leadership or, or, or by an enlightened sort of elite that decide that they need to move on rather than wait for the rest of society to give them direction. 
um, as to where to go. But that's that's just a hope and a prayer. Thank you, Jyoti. Um, Kathy, I know that uh, the Global South is, well, your, your research focus on the United States, but I think uh, given your experience, you'll be able to um, pick out perhaps what, what you think might might be relevant to a northern context from from the global south. Um, so I don't. The global south I know is Latin America. I spent over twenty years in and out of Chile um, and lived there several years during the dictatorship, um, where I was involved in the resistance. And Chile does not offer good lessons on policing to the United States. So I don't see those lessons being uh, very relevant. I, I do agree that the US is a settler co colonial state um, and that many of the racial boundaries that police enforce come from that. But policing is local. Um, we are trying to get more federal oversight for um, issues around police violence, but the biggest reforms, um, some of them have come from federal interventions like consent decrees, but most of them, have come from progressive mayors and police chiefs and community organizations that have worked hard to turn what they say the structure of incentives and rewards on its head to reward police from working with communities to provide safety one of the biggest um, some of the biggest providers of safety is just lights on the road so women can walk home safely it's um, restructuring uh, vacant lots into community parks but um, and keeping violent police accountable and off the streets. One use of force, you're off the street. Um, that also means reigning in the, the police unions who tend to defend uh, violence police and put pressures on mayors. But we have a real issue of changing how police interact with the communities where at least the global South, I know Latin America is trying to still move the police out of the military dictatorships of which they were part. So I, I find those issues really quite different. Great, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, well, that's, uh, we are out of time. So I'd like just to thank all the panelists for a really stimulating discussion. Um, we've covered, as Andrea said, a large portion of the globe, um, and you know, inevitably, there's there's work to be done. Um, but it, we, you know, it's really great to see the, the parallels across the various contexts. And, um, and thank you to again to the panelists for helping to uh, have such a really in-depth discussion. Um, so I'll just remind people that we have our final event on the fourth of June, which is How Can Donors Best Assist Reform. Um, and uh, that will conclude our series. But thank you all for your attendance and uh, look forward to seeing some of you again. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.